Dragon Lance, Dragons of Spring Dawning, by Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman, published in September of 1985, Volume 3 of the Dragon Lance Chronicles. The Queen of Darkness prepares to unleash her armies and dragon high lords in a decisive final strike against the peoples of Kryn. All that stands in evil's way are Tannis Half Elven and his companions Caramon, Raistlin, Flint, Tasselhoff, Tika, and Lorana. Together they will take the fight into the very heart of darkness, the Dark Queen City, Naraka. In this blighted land, the very fate of the world will be decided for good or for evil. Hi hey everyone, and welcome back to Zio's Book Club once again, and I am a It is my distinct pleasure to announce to you that I have finally, some 30 years after first seeing it on a bookshelf and thinking it looked like my jam, finished the Dragonlance Chronicles trilogy, or uh, about 2% of the total Dragonlance literary canon. Uh, You realize that uh, based on my online little bit of research, there are 152 of these fucking things. That's that's pretty crazy. Uh, If I actually was the sort of person who had any... uh, patience or willingness to ability to focus on a goal i feel like it would make a good youtube channel idea right to just go through and review all 152 dragonlance novels but i probably won't do that because uh too adhd for that i'm afraid but uh so let's just get into it and this will be a very spoilery review of uh the final dragonlance uh trilogy novel so we uh, hit the ground running at the beginning of dragons of spring dawning uh tannis has uh, if, if you may recall at the end of dragons of winter night was uh, seduced by the evil dragon high lord kitiara his ex-girlfriend and he's just gotten done uh filling her in every hole he's uh still stuck in the inn he kind of sneaking out past the draconian guards right some people spying on him, trying to find him. He gets back to his friends, Tika, uh, I think Gold Moon River, when Caramon, Raistlin are all there. And they're heading back to the ship. They're trying to get the fuck out of there before they get caught. Uh, they're too slow. They're too slow, all right? Uh, Kitiara comes in on her dragons, trying to blow them out of the water. And that's basically the bulk of what the first uh, 50 pages consist of. It's just kind of an extended sort of a frantic chase scene to, as it turns out, more or less unsuccessfully get the hell out of this city. I shouldn't say unsuccessfully. Once they get sunk in the sea, other stuff goes down. But yeah, uh, that's basically uh, the first 50 pages there, a real chase scene. And 50 pages is actually a a uh, non-negligible amount of this book. Uh, Unlike uh, the vast majority of other fantasy series out there, which uh, bloat as they go on, I feel that's certainly the standard in damn near every fantasy series i've ever read this one is actually uh, shrinking as they go on i think at autumn twilight the first book was some um 440 pages something like that then we went down to like 400 for winter night and now we're down to like 370 so they're just getting uh, slimmer as they go on very pacey i uh, have my positive impressions of its uh, quick uh, runtime uh runtime uh, in a movie mindset obviously and maybe some criticisms too but you know one thing i will say is that i was looking at the publication dates here and was uh quite fascinated to see that apparently this came out just two months after dragons of winter night uh spring dawning did now i doubt that literally means that they uh, wrote the book in 60 days but i guess it but i mean these books both did come out the year after autumn twilight so uh they must have written them both pretty quick i mean i assume that spring dawning was probably mostly or even completely written before winter night uh, hit the shelves but uh, however they did it, that's an impressive pace, impressive pace. If uh, George R. R. Martin wrote The Winds of Winter at that pace, then I guess we would have got it sometime around uh, spring of 2012, right? <laughs> but anyway, Tannis and company get uh, blown out of the water by uh, Kityar, or blown under the water, I should say. And uh, we then switch uh, kind of points of view to this library uh, where we meet this figure named Astinus, and uh, he's a chronicler. He's a historian, not an ordinary human uh, chronicler or historian. He's a immortal, godly figure who sees all and knows all and reads all and uh, just writes and writes and writes every event that ever takes place in Kryn. He's a very kind of lofty figure, reminding me almost of Tom Bombadil uh, from Fellowship of the Ring in a way, and how he feels so above all the other characters. And then Raistlin, who teleported out of there after uh, getting about to be sunk in the ship by Kitiara's dragons, he ends up in that library, and he's he's weak. He's dying. Astinus is like, eh, let him look at the books. Doesn't matter. He's about to die anyway. 
and we don't catch up with Raceland for uh, quite some time. Also there in the city uh, with Raceland, uh, not with him, but in the same city, another part of the same city is a uh, Team Lorana, Flint, Tasseloff, no longer Team uh, Sturm, sadly, R.I.P. Sturm, blown away by Kitiara. Lorana gets a little uh, a D, uh, an edict, you know, from the Knights of Salamnia, uh, making her basically the golden general, the head of the, uh, oh, just the general. Then she becomes known as the golden general because her leadership of the Knights of Salamnia and the people, again, uh, battle against the Queen of Darkness is is so effective that she's she rises up to be a hero of the people, the golden general. And I feel this subplot was skimmed over a little too quickly. I could have used a little bit more of her uh, kind of leading battles and uh, her strat- her strategic mind at work, seeing how she became the golden general. Kind of skipped ahead here. It's not that I didn't believe it with how we saw her grow in Winter Night. It's more that we just felt like we skipped to the end a little bit with it. And then some good dragons arrive. Uh, to some they're not the evil dragons are the the primary colors or secondary colors. You got your red, blue, green dragons. They're evil. Our good dragons are bronze, silver, gold, copper. But I feel like their arrival ends up being a little bit anticlimactic for a couple reasons. Uh, one, uh, well, it's uh, Lorana's brother Gilthanos who brings them. Uh, the evil dragons see they had kept the good dragons in check by telling them they had their children captive. But it turns out, unfortunately, the children got shish kebab long ago. They, they're they not with us. So uh, Gilthanos reveals this to them, and they join us. We're really just told all this, though, about how the good dragons got there. It feels like something as impactful as good dragons showing up to help fight the evil dragons should have been shown a little more than, you know, show, don't tell, right? But it feels like we kind of fail the show, don't tell test a little bit there. We're just told, yeah, I went on an adventure and got the, the good dragons, you know, it's not the worst thing in the world, but it feels a little bit like, uh, oh, okay. But uh, my bigger problem maybe with the uh, good dragons and their arrival is that I feel like uh, in this trilogy in general, there's been kind of a gradual uh, power level creep. Uh, I think that's kind of an anime <laughs> a fandom term for it. But uh, with our number of dragons, right? At the beginning uh, in like Dragons of Autumn Twilight, there were only a few dragons in the whole book. I think there was the black dragon helping to guard the uh, discs of Mishakal or whatever, in the middle, and then uh, like a red dragon at the end, and Verminard, hanging out with Verminard, and uh, each dragon felt, you know, singular, powerful, impactful, deadly. Uh, It's that, uh, you know, kung fu trope, right? 100 uh, kung fu enemies are surrounding our hero, no problem. You know they're in no danger, they'll take them all out. One kung fu enemy approaches our hero, our hero's in deep shit. The same kind of goes here a little bit. Um, Once... So then we had a few more dragons in Winter Night. Still pretty impactful because all the blue dragons came in and killed Sturm at the High Claris Tower, right? And you felt the uh, the power of them there. Now we describe, describe the, the sky just thick with just teeming wheels. Of, like it's dragons upon dragons upon dragons. Just hundreds of dragons, maybe thousands of dragons. The sky's full of dragons. There's, It's like it just, just swarms of dragons like fucking locusts, you know? And they lose their kind of their what makes them special a little bit there. They lose their power. They lose their impact. And so when you just chuck more dragons in the mix, but now they're good, it's kind of like, oh, OK, you know, I'm a little more interested, less interested in the dragons now and more in our just kind of core characters. Uh, that said, I will say that the actual dragon war chapter in the sky, the uh, the, the sky jousting with dragon lances with a. Flint and Tassel off on a good dragon. That was a cool chapter. If they ever got their shit together and made an actual, like, competently made uh, Dragonlance animated thing, like maybe a episodic TV show instead of the shitty movie they once made, uh, this would make a really cool episode. Get the uh, Castlevania animators on it, right? But uh, I don't know. I, I imagine, like, a different take on this maybe where there are more dragons. Yes, it has escalated. The Queen of Darkness's uh, number of dragons, but maybe uh, instead of hundreds or whatever, she has gotten like a, a couple dozen or a few dozen dragons. Enough that it's that it's uh, impactful that, holy shit, there's a lot more now, but it's not going crazy. And then how about the good guys get, you know, maybe five or six or ten dragons to go up against this somewhat larger force. Then I feel... It, it would have had more impact to me if it had been a, a little little calmer in that sense. And then uh, despite being the golden general, apparently a strategic uh, 
mastermind on the field of battle, uh, a brilliant military tactician. Lorana gets caught by the most obvious uh, villainous trap of all time. Uh, they're like, we have Tana. She's like, this is probably a trap, but I'm going to check it out. Uh, it is a trap. Uh, she checks out and she gets captured and uh, is basically held captive now until the end of the book. Uh, nice going, Lorana. A plus move. And then we finally catch up with Tannis again after him and his uh, company appear to be sunk in the uh, the Blood Sea. Of course, they weren't uh, sunk and killed 50 pages into the book. Uh, no, they're in a kind of an underwater city. And uh, they wander around there a little bit, get a little bit lost. But they agree to have the city masters take them uh, back to the surface. This is another bit that feels like it's skimmed over a little bit too quickly to me. It's kind of like commit to it or don't do it. I don't know. It's, it's funny because... In a genre where I feel like a bloat and a poor pacing in terms of being too long, too descriptive of stuff, uh, chapters and scenes stretching out uh, too far is more the problem when it comes to pacing. Here's a high fantasy novel. It's actually it's going through stuff too quickly. The rise to the golden general, the underwater city, um, uh, some stuff with Raceland we'll discuss a little bit later. It's it's kind of like stumbling, like it's like racing to the finish. It's like, oh, calm down a little bit. Uh, this is a rare high fantasy novel that I feel like an extra 50, 75 pages could actually uh, be a boon to it, uh, benefit the pacing, uh, improve the strength of the storytelling and characterization. But anyway, then some uh, flying castles sent from the Queen of Darkness to hover over the uh, human cities of Kryn, uh, some straight out of a JRPG basically show up, and then we'll ride off into the climax, which uh, the climax in this case really constituting basically the second half of the book. Uh, before we get too deep into that, I guess I just should discuss our uh, lineup of villains a little bit here. Of course, we had the Queen of Darkness. Uh, she has a name, Takissus. Uh, I'll be honest, I think that's an ugly name. I, I don't like it. I don't like <laughs> Takissus one bit. So I'm just going to stick with the Queen of Darkness. But we'll discuss her a little bit more uh, later because I want to discuss her in context of her city, Naraka. Uh, then we have uh, Kitiara, Lord Soth, and Ariakis, our other villains. Ariakis, uh didn't make too much of an impact on me. He just kind of feels like a generic evil guy. Nothing really separating him from Verminard in Autumn Twilight. Uh, I do like Kitiara, Dragon High Lord Babe, curly black hair, seductive, evil, powerful, cool armor, cool blue dragon. Uh, do like Kitiara. I dug her. All the scenes with her. Always happy to see her again in the book. And then Lord Soth is an interesting one. Personality-wise, you could kind of argue that like Ariaki, he's kind of a generic evil guy. But he has this kind of like spectral uh, presence, like a lich, like powerful, a tragic backstory where he used to be a good knight who kind of fell to evil. And now he's just this like undead, creepy, ghostly sort of figure. I kind of skimmed the uh, Dragonlance wiki a little bit and saw he's, I guess, appears in future books. And I'm reading that and I'm like, yeah, that's good. This guy actually does have the screen presence, so to speak, to... Um, be the lead villain in uh, future Dragonlance stories, I think. I uh, did like Lord Soth. So our final good guy party for the assault on Naraka is, of course, Tannis Half-Elven, Flint Fireforge the Dwarf, who uh, sadly does not make it to uh, Naraka at all. He's laid low by a heart attack. A strangely realistic way to go for a fantasy novel, but, you know, it's a little bitterness to cut the fantasy that works. So uh, Flint is not part of the uh, final assault on Naraka, sadly, uh, R.I.P. Flint. Uh, it makes sense, though, because it wouldn't make sense for the bad guys to not recognize um, them immediately when they try to pose as uh, soldiers of the Queen of Darkness. There's a fucking dwarf there with them, so it's okay. So, Flint, sorry, you're out on the final um, assault on Naraka. We got Tannis Half-Elven, Tasseloff, Tika, who I underestimated when she joined the party back in Autumn Twilight. I was like, here's a fucking hanger on. But uh, no, she stuck with uh, the party all the way into the final attack on the Queen of Darkness in the heart of her evil city. So credit to Tika. I underestimated you when you joined the party, all right? I was wrong. Uh, with Karamon and uh, Barum, uh, who are green gemstone men, are living MacGuffin. Uh, he's not too good. Uh, I feel like this is uh, kind of a third-rate uh, MacGuffin. We got a green gemstone. Uh, I liked the blue crystal staff in the first book just fine as a MacGuffin. I don't know why we moved on from that so much, other than the fact that we moved on from Gold, Moon, and Riverwind. They're basically just, they were shunted down to cameo status in Winter Night, knocked down even further here in Spring Dawning, just uh, 
Tannis is basically just like, yeah, I don't need y'all anymore. You're here out of the party. <laughs> and that's it. So much for being so part of the eight legendary heroes of Kryn. And uh, yeah, Lorana's role is decreased too, I guess, really. So, so it's funny. I discussed how before how Dragonlance obviously is uh, dig mining deep from the well of Lord of the Rings in terms of its world building races uh, some of its general themes it's it's flavor you know it's lore obviously but it wasn't ripping off lord of the rings plot so much in the early going in autumn uh, twilight and winter night it was doing its own thing uh i gotta take all that back because the um climax of this book is pure unleaded just unfiltered sneaking into mordor to destroy the one ring to defeat sauron except it's sneaking into naraka to destroy the green gemstone uh to defeat the queen of darkness straight up tolkien lord of the rings return of the king ripoff here not that it doesn't work in that sense of uh, lord of the rings is a legendary for a reason but it's a little disappointing like oh yeah i actually read this one you guys i even saw a nice little peter jackson movie about it even aside from the kind of rip off elements i did fe- find myself feeling a little unsure about elements of this whole climactic sequence uh, by climactic sequence i mean the basically the second half of the book it did feel very big scale and epic in a way i liked seeing all the armies of evil assemble you know this giant antechamber right army after army after army is coming in uh all the draconians the dragons the dragon high lords the goblins all to kneel before uh the queen of darkness who has a great introduction by the way she can't step on to whatever the material plane whatever the D bullshit is there she's stuck in the godly realm right but she creates a negative space that everyone perceives in like the throne platform above and everyone has to bow before that that space's presence it's it's evil just majesty even tanis who's obviously the queen of darkness's enemy even he has to bow before the power of just the absence of all light and goodness she creates up there that's a good introduction i like that what I didn't like so much about the climactic sequence in the kind of a giant chamber with the armies and the Queen of Darkness and Tannis and Ariakas and Kidiara and all that was this crown of power everyone's like squabbling over and trying to get. Supposedly it gives you power over the everyone, except obviously it doesn't because Tannis just goes up to Ariakas who has it and kills him. Um, he shouldn't be able to do that because he has the crown of power, right? Again, we're failing the show don't tell test here. You're telling me this crown's real important, but you're not showing me. And um, yeah, and Barum jumping into this fucking jeweled pillar and destroying the green gemstone. And it's a load bearing pillar because then Niraka starts blowing up and collapsing. It uh, Yes, it feels very third rate destroying the one ring. But uh, comparing things to Lord of the Rings, comparing things anyway, I'm thinking about the Return of the King movie, because it's an excellent movie. But uh, it's like Autumn Twilight, the climax here of Spring Dawning isn't a battle in any sense of the word. It's more a kind of frantic escape sequence from disaster. Uh, Second book, we've done that. I wonder if um, Return of the King, the movie, actually maybe influenced the high fantasy genre to end uh, books more with like epic battles on battlefields and because i feel like after 2003 2004 so you do see more of that because that's definitely not here in the climax the climax is about sneaking and destruction and escape also speaking of uh return of the king it's kind of interesting how the barum uh backstory with finding the green jewel and accidentally killing his sister in a fight over it is virtually identical to the Smeagol Deagol scene that Return of the King opens with, right? I'm not saying Peter Jackson ripped it off or anything, but I just thought the parallel was a little bit interesting. And then Raceland shows up. Last we saw him, he was dying in Astonis' library, a pathetic wretch, his power all drained, but now he's in black robes and he's a fucking badass, uh, blowing motherfuckers away with his epic lightning powers, uh, total deus ex machina. Um, this is uh, another place where we could use uh, some more goddamn chapters filling in what happened here. Now, I am aware that there is a interquel novel called uh, Dragons of the Hourglass Mage that takes place in the body of this novel. Um, I'm going to go ahead and assume from the title that it is fills in the gaps, but I have to judge uh, Spring Dawning based on the text of the novel, not a novel uh, interquel that came out 20 years later. And here, uh, yeah, there's just too much of a gap between early book Raceland and Black Robe Raceland. Um, we could use a little bit more. 
But uh, complaints aside, I will say that this does lead to one of the single best moments of the entire book, where uh, Caramon is wounded, and uh, Raceland, who of course has constantly had to physically lean on his brother throughout the entirety of the trilogy up to this point because of his physical weakness, uh, now a powerful Raceland looks to his wounded brother Caramon and says, lean on me, brother. And uh, that was a, a moment that kind of like, despite the fact that Raceland is apparently evil now, you got to... Show me a little more of why that is, because he just seems to be helping to feed, fight the Queen of Darkness here. But despite his evil status, I read that and I was like, yeah, it's good moment. Good, uh, heartfelt, good heartfelt little character flip there. Then the good guys escape, of course, and it turns out that the uh, wizard Fizzbon, the forgetful kind of Gandalfian figure they've been uh, hanging out with throughout uh, much of the three books. They're also hanging out with him a little bit here before they went to Naraka. It turns out he's actually the god of goodness uh, Paladine. Uh, and, uh, that's definitely kind of an eh, plot twist to me. Uh, I'm not really into that kind of deity assistance in fantasy books. I read another fantasy series earlier this year, The Song of the Lioness Quartet uh, by Tamora Pierce. That one also had the um, goddess of that world coming down and talking and hanging out with the main character, and I didn't like it there, and I uh, don't really like it here either. It, uh, I feel like it reduces the heroism of our heroes by making them the special ones, the chosen ones of the god who presumably has billions of people to look out for, but he's instead spending all his time hanging out with these uh, same like half dozen folks or so. Uh, there is kind of an interesting way to do this with the god figures, I, I th feel like, by making uh, our characters unhappy and unwilling, basically pawns in the... Uh, ever escalating and duel of the gods say between paladine and takisus right but uh like a like game like pieces in a game of celestial chess they're stuck in and maybe trying to break above that but uh uh this book isn't that thoughtful about it nope it's just the the god of goodness paladine thought tanis and his uh his boys and his gals are pretty cool and just hanging out with them and helping them out and i was kind of like eh, i don't know that cheapens their accomplishments i feel like that a god was helping him the whole time, so not not huge on that. Uh, that said, that does lead to another one of the couple of real good emotional moments toward the end of the book, where Paladine uh, talks to Tasselhoff about how Flint is in the afterlife, relaxing and grumbling under a tree, waiting for uh, his dear friend Tass to show up and tell him about his adventures. And uh, I can't say I was too uh, tearful reading about Flint's death itself just because it seems so sudden like I have a heart attack and now I'm out but reading this part and Tasselhoff's reaction to it uh, thinking about how he's looking forward to seeing Flint again one day that that was a nice emotional moment that uh lent weight to Flint's death you know a hundred pages after it happened through Tasselhoff's uh, grief but a uh, joy to hear that Flint is still out there thinking about him somewhere on some plane of uh, existence. And uh, yep, minus a little bit of a cool down, that then is it. Uh, we have the implication that uh, Tannis and Lorana are maybe going to go off together now. Lorana is finally, finally, after three books, going to live out her, her deepest dream of having a half-elfin cock uh, six inches deep in her. Now, Tannis is a badass. It's it's seven inches, I think, for him. But uh, yes, yeah, so that... And there's some kind of a little denouement with Raceland, which I assume is setting up the... Uh, future Caramon Raceland novels that I know about their existence, but I don't know about anything that happens in them. I'll get to those one day. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, but uh, so that kind of ends up with a, of the initial eight kind of heroes we were introduced to in that uh, inn at the beginning of Autumn Twilight, everyone kind of uh, is going off in pairs to, in various extents. Uh, Sturm and Flint, of course, dead. Uh, two, Goldmoon and Riverwind are shunted down to uh, supporting characters and kicked out of the damn party. Uh, bittersweet sort of endings for two, Tannis and Tasseloff, and promises of future adventures for Caramon and Raceland. So uh, it's kind of like a four different sort of uh, groups that I would uh, lump all these characters in, where they ended up. So that about wraps it up for the Dragonlance Chronicles trilogy, and I would say that overall, despite uh, the fact that I've made gripes through all three of these reviews, it, it does, I think, feel well-formed as a trilogy. Uh, there's kind of three distinct parts, an escalating action through all, an escalating scope of the war uh, through it all, and a, a good layering of main villains uh, through the trilogy, first Verminard, then Kitiara, then Takisis, the Queen of Darkness, and... 
the way that escalates is, uh, you know, I guess it escalated. We started with, you know, Fewmaster Toad, right? Then Verminard, then Kitiara, then Ariakas and Lord Soth, then the Queen of Darkness. And I like the escalation of that. Uh, for better or worse, I guess the MacGuffins also escalated with uh, the blue crystal staff, uh, then the dragon lances and dragon orbs, and then uh, Barum the green gemstone man. <laughs> if I have kind of a uh, deeper uh, criticism of the entire trilogy, it would be kind of the stop-start nature of the character arcs. For example, Raceland is a huge part of the mythology, apparently not just this trilogy, but of the greater world, but... Really, uh, he's absent for enormous chunks of the text of both the second book, Winter Night, and this book. And uh, Lorana, for example, is huge in the second book, now drops substantially in the third book, uh, River, Wind, and Gold Moon. Uh, this gives it a, the, the books a good ensemble nature. We're always checking on different characters, different subplots, but it does uh, occasionally create a little bit of a sense of whiplash. Like, this is a main character. Oh, nope, they're out. It's a little bit... Uh, Feels kind of unfocused, I would say. But overall, yes, I would say that the uh, roughly 1,200-page journey taking Tannis and his companions from a cozy little reunion in the uh, woodland inn of uh, Solus, uh, gradually to standing in the heart of darkness before the assembled armies of the Queen of Darkness uh, tasked with saving the world. I would say it's a it's a journey worth taking, and uh, especially, uh, you know, maybe not if you're looking for high literature, but I, I'm going to go out on a limb and say no one looking at my fucking channel is looking for high literature. No, if you're a fan of good old old school elves and dragons and wizards fantasy, yeah, this is a journey worth taking. And uh, overall, uh, my thumbs up, my thumbs up for the Dragonlands Chronicles trilogy. And like I was saying earlier, I'd love to see an actual kind of competent approach at maybe like an animated, uh, not a movie, like a series. Like, let's get like a, you get eight to 10 episodes out of each book, like, you know, 25, 30 minute episodes. That would be pretty damn cool. I think they should, they should look into that. But uh, yeah, that's uh, more or less my thoughts on Dragons of Spring Dawning. Thanks for listening. Thanks for hanging out on Zio's Book Club. And I'll uh, check in back with y'all real soon. Peace. Peace.